Hello, my name is Morgan Gray, and welcome back to the Afrocentric Podcast. Get your house in order. We don't fuck with people who don't support the LGBTQ plus community. And baby, we damn sure don't fuck with anybody who don't love a beautiful black queen, baby. You see this tape? And they go low, I go low. You don't let nobody act black and then go home and be white? I got two pistols and a pit bull. Me. That's all I need. It only takes a little bit of white brainwash to activate the cool chip in the average Negro. You think Harriet Tubman was walking around with a fucking nice shiny fucking dress on with a fucking crown on her head when she was taking slaves to freedom? And a lot of white folk have demonstrated eloquently that they don't have no sense. And we are back with the Afrocentric podcast the title of this episode is freestyle three get your house in order now if you cannot tell by the tone of my voice this will be a more somber podcast i feel very gloomy and based and suggested off of the title of this episode feel like other people feel it to. In this episode, we will be talking about life after the election. Moreover, in this episode, we will not be talking about the election. I will not tell anybody who to vote for. Now, I want to talk about the importance of the community, the importance of community organizing and resource sharing. I want to talk about the need for continuity plans and what to do regardless of the election outcomes. Um, In this episode, we will be focusing on political violence and the potential for political violence after the election, as well as a discussion on historical precedents and current societal tensions. We will be focusing on self-hate amongst Black people, as well as the potential and the seen violence towards Black people in Great Britain, as well as social anti-Blackness that has been seen on social media. Although I will not be talking about who to vote for, why someone should vote for someone, because there are plenty of social media activists real activists, scholars discussing that topic. I would like to be proactive in this episode instead of being reactive, which is something that we often do as a community and talk about the fact that I believe that regardless of who wins the election, there is a great chance of violence and backlash towards African-Americans, specifically African-American women and African-American members 
who are a part of the LGBTQIA community. Share this message. Share this message because it is definitely time for us as a community to be realistic, to look towards the future, and to get our houses in order, to get our ducks in order, to cross our T's and dot our I's and be prepared for the potential threat towards Black people in America. I will talk about a lot of the historical precedents that have led me to this conclusion, as well as give you guys a couple of solutions, ideas, things to be thinking about getting before November, before January. Now, if you like this content, and you would like to see more of this content, make sure that you are following, subscribing, and sharing. I love to hear you guys' thoughts and ideas. Make sure you're reaching out to me at the Afrocentric Podcast. And with that in mind, we will jump into the next segment. Let's talk about political violence post-election. And I know many of you are like, Morgan, what, what are you talking about? What do you mean when you say political violence post-election. So let's talk about what it is. What is it specifically? Political violence post-election, this phrase refers to acts of threats, of coercion, intimidation, physical harm that arise in the context of electoral competition. This violence is often employed to influence the electoral process, delay or disrupt polling, as well as to determine the outcome of elections. And it can manifest as efforts to secure the approval or disapproval of referendum questions or to intimidate political stakeholders to affect election results. Now, a great example of this Um, can be seen based off of a lot of political legislation that has been passed in the state of Alabama. Now, for those who do not know, in places like Alabama and in Georgia, they have passed laws that say that if you are standing in line in in an electoral booth getting ready to go and vote, you are not allowed to help any other person. There is no passing out water. There is no passing out snacks. There is no letting people sit in chairs. Okay. And Alabama is so extreme that you may not be able to give a person a ride to the polls. It's something I learned this weekend. So that in and of itself is um, an intimidation act. But we can go even further than that. You can talk about um, those who might be monitoring the polls. There is a potential for people to do intimidation tactics. And it um, it mirrors um, the Jim Crow era where African-Americans were forced to do literacy tests or to um, do poll taxes, different things in order to keep people from being able to vote, but you must modernize and then think about, well, how could this purposely affect me? Well, I'm sure that in some places something will erupt, and honestly, I can't even fathom of what somebody might do because people are becoming so extreme, but there is a potential for violence and chaos So I think that it would be wise not to wear any type of political anything when you go to the polls. Just be mindful and be demure. Again, now when I'm talking about political violence, let's talk about what it encompasses. Now, post-election violence includes a very great range of activities, things like protests and riots, mass gatherings that can potentially turn violent, and often in a response to perceived injustices or election fraud, targeted attacks directed at political figures, candidates, or electoral authorities to intimidate or eliminate opposition. Vandalism and property damage, the destruction of property belonging to political opponents or electoral institutions, violent 
protests, demonstrations that escalate into violence often met with heavy-handed responses by security forces. Lastly, armed clashes, conflict, con- conflicts between rival political parties or armed resistant groups. Now, after naming all of these different forms of post-election violence that can happen, you can almost think about a different example of all of these things that have happened in the very recent past. You can go as far, let's say 2020, so in the last four years, protests and riots. We are seeing an uptick in anti-Palestinian protests and riots. My fear is that they will become extremely violent in the case that Kamala Harris is elected as president of the United States. I've been working with this group as of lately, and one of the questions that they asked me was, how do you feel about Kamala Harris being elected as president? And I will tell you guys my very honest truth. I was scared. And I feel like this episode will reflect that. Because I don't want to fear monger. And that's not that's not what I would like to do. But I'm realistically looking at the past. And I'm thinking about how on social media lately, the um, Palestinian activists, and I'm using air quotes because they're just people that get on social media and run their mouth and spout out ideas. And I'm noticing that a lot of people are becoming insatiable. When I say insatiable, that means that they cannot have enough. These are the individuals that get on social media and only point out problems, but they never offer solutions. So, We are getting to the ninth and 10th month of the war against Palestine and Israel and the genocide that has been currently happening in Palestine. Very horrific, very graphic. It's been going on for months now. And this is one of the first wars that have been completely digitized and has been sprouting all over social media on TikTok on mostly because other apps are suppressing this type of information, but on TikTok, very graphic images of individuals being bombed on live, children murdered, women beat, people scared, high chances of anxiety, trying to escape, losing everything. It's terrible. And towards the end of the school year, We saw violent protests, vandalism, and property damage, especially from the Ivy Leagues, especially from the Ivy Leagues. And, you know, nothing has happened. America has accepted and made sure that they would fund this war and they are sending over materials, soldiers, weaponry, to Israel in order to aid in the task of abominating Hamas. And it is unfortunate. But when I get on social media, all I ever see is Ella Palestinian activists blaming African American people for the deaths of thousands of people across the sea. And it is specifically targeted towards black women. And it is heartbreaking because we are being blamed because we apparently are not doing enough in order to help. And they believe that if we decide to vote for Kamala Harris in this election, that we will be solidifying the fate of Palestinians across the sea because they believe that Kamala Harris will continue to fund Israel. I do not think that this is fair to blame black people for this especially under an administration in which Kamala Harris was not running but was a part of these are not her direct actions anyone knows that those actions come from the commander-in-chief which is at the time Joe Biden yet and still we are seeing more and more grotesques 
grotesque responses, answers, and we are seeing a rampant uptick of protests outside of the White House, outside of congressional businesses. We have seen violent rhetoric on social media. And my fear is that in the chance that Kamala Harris is elected, that not only will there be an uptake in social media threats and protests, but there will be an uptick of attacks on African-American people, specifically African-American women. Now, I say regardless of who wins. Now, there is a prevailing belief that the 2024 elections may not see a peaceful transfer of power. And that is regardless of the outcome. Why is that? It is because of, in my opinion, the extinction burst. For those who do not know, an extinction burst is a phenomenon observed in behavior psychology, particularly in the context of operant conditioning. And it refers to a temporary increase in the frequency, intensity, or duration of behavior after the reinforcement for the behavior has been removed. In other words, it is an escalation that occurs after an individual or an animal attempts to regain the previously available reinforcement. Now, in this context, I would say this. With the potential of a Kamala Harris election, it almost signifies the end of the reign of white supremacy or the potential. As I have been saying for the last three years, the birth rates amongst European Americans, white Americans, Caucasians, the birth rate in Europe, as well as whether people believe it or not, the birth rate in countries like China have dropped drastically. So there is a great potential that in the future that white people will not be the majority anywhere. It already is, but you you get what I'm saying. They will not be the majority. Secondly, with the signaling of the end of white supremacy is the signaling of the end of many social constructs and social etiquettes that will go extinct like like violent racism or the social clubs that people are able to be in that control things. Um, the end of the celebration of confederacy in some places, the ending of loud and obnoxious transphobia, homophobia, It puts an end to that, and that is something that has been normalized over the last 400 years because of the amount of power that white supremacies have held for generations, for for generations in America. Now, because we are coming to the potential end of this reign of white supremacy, It is going, this concept and those who encompass white supremacy are going through an extinction burst, which means that there will be a rampant uptick of political violence, racial violence, homo, homosexual and transsexual individuals, violence towards women in general. So that puts us all in jeopardy. Black people and those who encompass the intersection and live within the intersection. So that is a Black woman, a Black woman who is gay, a Black woman who is gay and and Jewish, a Black woman who is gay and Jewish and homeless, so on and so forth. So the deeper of the intersection in which the more of a target that you might be by violent hate crimes, because those who participate in white supremacy are going to go through a violent uptick in this, and it's because it is coming towards an extinction. So because it sees the ear, the end at nine, the extinction and the threat of ending will sizzle and it will burst. Now, let's talk about some of the key characteristics of 
an extinction bird so that you can be aware of what to look for when you see this. Now, there will be and there is the potential of an increase in behavior when a behavior that was previously reinforced is no longer rewarded, the individual intentionally increases the behavior in an attempt to obtain reinforcement. Next, the burst is typically short-lived, so it is temporary. If the reinforcement continues to be withheld, the behavior will eventually decrease and stop. Lastly, novel and novel behavior. Sometimes new behaviors may emerge during an extinction burst as the individual tries different strategies to regain the reinforcement. Now, Morgan, now you might be asking yourself, nigga, Morgan, why does this happen? I don't like, I mean, like, it's because of the persistence of learned behavior. You know, I feel like that might be common sense. The individual, the people, the group, they have learned that a particular behavior leads to a reward. When a reward is removed, they persist in the behavior, often with greater intensity to try to bring back the reward. Frustration response, that is another reason why extinction bursts happen. The sudden lack of expected reinforcement can lead to frustration, which may manifest in an increase in the behavior. Lastly, a historical reinforcement. The longer and more consistently a behavior has been reinforced, the more pronounced the extinction burst is likely to be. Now, I believe that this belief is fueled by a lot of things, but I feel like this belief can be proved based off of things like historical precedents. I mean, were y'all not here for January 6th? If you weren't, let me give you an, a reminder. January 6th was an insurrection that exemplified how contagious elections, contentious elections can lead to significant violence. On January 6th of 2021, there was an assault on the United States Capitol. That is an example of how political violence can erupt following elections. How did the insurrection begin, you might ask? The insurrection began as a, a direct result of efforts by the then President Donald J. Trump and the J stand for jackass to delegitimize Joe Biden's presidency and his electoral victory. Donald Trump and his allies, and those allies include Senator Ted Cruz, Josh Howey, have propagated unfounded conspiracy theories of widespread voter fraud, which fueled the anger and actions of Donald Trump supporters and a mob aimed to and to stop the certification of electoral votes, believing that they were defending the rightful winner of the election. So much so that they were there to potentially murder the vice president, Mike Pence, and Nancy Pelosi. See, that's the problem with social media. Stuff happens so quickly and they put so much in your face. It's like people not only forget the event, but forget the intentions behind it. Now, for those who might just be confused, well, Morgan, who started this? Well, the influencer of this whole event was the then president, Donald J. Trump. And the J stand for just a feeling. Who for months incited and enticed his supporters by spreading false claims about the election being stolen. And on the day of the insurrection, Donald Trump urged the crowd to march to the Capitol and quote unquote fight. Now there are mother, there are a multitude of other people because you know, Donald Trump ain't back, ain't that big. He can't just hold up all that blame by himself. There were multiple people who were a part of this like a representative Mo Brooks, Paul Gossier, Senators Josh Hawley, and Ted Cruz, 
who supported Donald Trump's baseless claims and objections to the electoral certification. Now, that was then when Trump could not get what he wanted and he threw a hissy fit. There's more on the line now. Donald Trump has been convicted for countless feelings. And if he does not win, he is going to go to jail. This presidency not only is an ego boost for Donald Trump, because he did. This is also an, a way for him to be able to keep himself out of jail for the rest of his life. Uh, Kamala's going to get elected. It's going to be so great. We're going to win and everything's going to be fine. No, no, it's not going to be fine. Hi, I study the far right and we're going to see political violence one way or another this fall. So to talk to you about what's going to happen if Kamala gets elected, you have to understand something about militia activity and how democracies function. So starting with militia activity, historically, militias have enjoyed uh, spurts in membership and activity when a Democrat has been in power. And they have decreased in their membership and activities with Republicans in power, probably because they felt like their gun rights would be supported. That changed with the election of Donald Trump. We saw an increase in militia activity, probably because he was hyping them all up about how dangerous all these immigrants were and how Antifa was coming and blah, 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 right? So we have tiny armies all over the United States who know the places that they are from geographically much better than the U.S. Army does, yes? gonna remind you that the U.S. Army has never won a guerrilla war in any country. And if Kamala gets elected and two-thirds of Republicans who already believe that Biden wasn't elected, if they're told again that the election was stolen from Donald Trump because how could Donald Trump lose twice when he got so many votes, they're going to believe that. They've been primed to believe that. And what would you do if you were in their position? We know from polls that Republicans, conservatives, Christian nationalists in particular, are much more supportive of violence when they answer the question, sometimes patriots must resort to violence in order to save the country. They're like, check, violence is okay. I want you to know that democracy absolutely relies on trust and there is no trust in democracy right now and we can lay that at the feet of the elites who are driving affective polarization, which is the type of polarization where people hate each other. They don't trust the other party. They see that person getting elected, not just as like a wah, wah, but as an existential crisis. And on the right, it's because they think that they are in a cosmic war with the devil, which is the left. We are actually, as regular Americans, not that far apart on the actual issues. We are suffering from affective polarization driven by elites seeking power. Democracies don't work if one party thinks that compromising is compromise with the devil. So would they start a civil war if Kamala gets elected? I think we'd see secession movements, really strong ones. Um, it would be interesting. I mean, these like militia groups, these Right-wing groups have been advocating for secession for a really long time now, and maybe it would work. Anyway, if you would like to know more, you can read this great book called How Democracies Die, which is about how democracies die. Uh, they also have a section on how to save them. There are a lot of current societal tensions that are going on right now. There are a lot of issues related to race, class, gender, and religion, and they contribute to the idea of a potential volatile environment in the United States post-election. Now, there is a large influence of extremist groups. There is both a far right as well as a far left. And these groups pose a risk for electoral related violence, which can destabilize the domestic political stability and international standing. Let's talk about it. There are current societal tensions and they have an intentional and a potential, they have a potential to impact us 
not only on and i think that i think that people see it on social media and they don't think that it's going to hit home but even and this was seen during covid in 2020 when donald trump was um calling the coronavirus um the chinese virus he his words impacted asian americans not only were they afraid They were hurt. Many of them, especially the elder Asian American people, were hit. A lot of them were pushed, kicked. I'm not sure if anybody was killed, but it led to the passing of the Asian hate bill. And I do need to remind you that as African American people, there is no legislation to protect us from race violence. That is one of the biggest things that has discouraged people about uh, the potential of a Joe Biden election. The fact that there has been no George Floyd bill. There has been no anti-black hate bill. So if something happens to us, they there is a high potential of people being able to get away with it. Now, I want to talk about these micro debates that have been going around about Vice President Kamala Harris's racial identity. And I wanted to talk about the one drop rule. Okay, now during the debate, um, Donald Trump ended up going to do an interview with the national black journalists um a couple weeks ago and during his interview in a room with many in all black nationally accredited writers editors like he created a potential of a doubt around surrounding kamala harris's ethnicity now for those who do not know and have been confused and brainwashed by media. Kamala Harris is biracial. She, her father is Jamaican and her mother is South Asian. She's Indian. So she is equally both. And she does not lean to one or the other. Kamala, but she was raised in the United States and she has lived this life as an African-American woman. And how do we know this? We know this based off the things she did before she even became the vice president or a senator, went to a historically black college. She joined a black sorority. She is an AKA. She identifies and walks through life as an African-American woman, and she presents as one, and she was raised as one. Now, back in the old days, there was the one-drop rule. So as long as you had one drop of African-American blood in your body, you was always a nigga. That's why there was such a great fear when African-American people like who were Creole or albino or extremely light-skinned were able to pass because of the one drop rule. They were fearful if someone found out that they were indeed African-American, that their social, their social extravagancy that they were able to have would disappear because all you needed was one drop. So what is it now when they changed the the, the whole the goalposts and they said, oh, she married to a white man. Oh, she oh, she was in. Donald Trump said she was Indian all this other time, but now she want to be a black woman. Who, as a white man, I would encourage you to stay out of black women's business. That's one. But not only does she identify as a black woman. There are so many different spaces that have accepted that she was a black woman. Nevertheless, regardless if she is a black woman, she is the most certified to run. And she is quite more certified than Donald Trump. The sex offender, the felon, the failed businessman. Be for real. So with the dis 
illusion of the middle class and the increasing economic disparities and the contribution of societal unrest, you can see these tensions and their link to a, a potential impact. There are issues among sensuality and gender. Oh my God, this is another topic that um, is really tearing our community apart because there is a social rift between trans women and natural born women, particularly amongst Black American women. And it leads to an increased amount of transphobia. Let's talk about it. I just want to take a moment and really talk about this social rift that's going on. Um, transgenderism has been around not long at all. Um, there were at first, you know, cross-dressers, but with new technology and the ability to have surgery and the implementation of hormones, transgenderism is here, okay? So with all due respect to the trans community, the trans community has been very, and not all, but some have been very disrespectful towards women. It is the delusion with some of trans some of the trans women within our country and the overboardness that is turning off a lot of black women and I can understand why there has been a lot of social media videos of uh trans women claiming to be pregnant which is impossible because they do not have ovaries. They cannot bore children. I've seen trans women claim that they can lactate milk. And if that's, if that's possible, that's good for them. But it still doesn't make them a natural born woman. It is getting to a point where you are seeing a lot of people on social media normalizing not only transphobia, but trans hate. I think one of the greatest perpetuators of spreading trans hate in the Black community probably would be Tasha K. And the way she does it um, online, she does it constantly. And she also goes out of her way to find articles that um, embarrass trans people. I don't think that black women have an issue with coexisting with trans people. I think that they have a problem with the lack of respect that comes from the trans community. And I think oftentimes a lot of trans people read this as black women are jealous that they look better than real black women and there's uh, there's this growing divide and this growing amount of hate that is really sad to see it's very it's very very sad to see number one i really hate seeing black women being so vicious and rude on the internet but i'll never be a person to condemn them for it because they feel threatened so they feel the need to protect themselves so i understand it I love seeing black women be at peace. And when they are threatened, they say some of the nastiest, most vicious, down low shit. And when I'm on social media as an observer, I'm simply that I'm an observer. If I see something on social media that I don't like, I swipe. It's very rare that I feel the need to communicate. I'm not a troller by any means, but there are some people who live to troll whether they be bots or they be real people, right? I feel like another example of this is when we see Joe Netta, Miss Netta on social media, right? <laughs> Joe Netta has taken a pregnancy test, okay? Joe Netta cross-dresses. She wears makeup, she wears... But Joe Netta is offensive. Recently, um, she was um, on social media and she got upset because she said that a lot of black women were bullying her. And she said that she would never want to be a black woman, even though 
Jonet literally is a black man who dresses up and presents herself as a black woman and uses the character and attributes online in order to fuel his persona and make money off of it. She said she would rather be a white woman because white women know how to mind they beef this, okay? And Jonetta says, there are more black women in my comments spreading hate than anyone else. And that's true. Y'all be on her ass. And it's true. And it's not just black women. It is both black gay men. And it is also black straight men. I see and I watch black men tell Jonetta to shreds on the internet. Nasty, rude, vile things. The stuff that Jonetta says hurts my feelings. But it's not enough for me to get on the internet and be cool to someone. I'm still an ally at the end of the day. That's what I think that's what makes this situation so much sadder is the fact that we are black women, trans women are very small communities and we are very endangered communities. Trans women are killed at a higher rate than black women are, but black women are are killed at a very high rate and in an alarming rate and the trans black women community is even smaller than the black women's community so theoretically you would want both groups to work together to advocate for one another and to protect one another yet there is a rift and that is the problem because and i want people to understand this trans hate affects all women whether you believe it or not a great example of this can be seen in recent history during the olympics during the boxing match there was a white woman fighting a nigerian boxer she had been biting bitch had been fighting and boxing and and uppercutting and roundhouse kicking and tan ass up until she hit this white woman so hard she thought that she that the police had freed her nigga. And then she got angry and she said that she was a man. News flash people. Do you see a nigga around here? Yes, yeah, she had more testosterone in her hormones, but she was a woman. She bleed once a month, just like the rest of us. She put her tampon in one leg up just like the rest of us. Okay, and the rate in which the misinformation travel astronomical, but that is an example of how transphobia affects real women. Cause imagine if she was a man, they would have told her ass a new one, but she was not. There is this potential violence, and these current social tensions have a large potential of impact. I want people to be cognizant because the majority of these issues point at one group, one community. And it is signaling and, and, and isolating one particular group, the black woman. And you see it everywhere. And like I said, the LGBTQ is being, community is being isolated too. And you want to know how you know that? You go read Project 2025 for yourself. The the Black LGBTQ plus community is probably the most educated and the most aware of the potential social impact and political impact that Project 2025 will have on their community because it is threatening their community. It's going to eliminate PrEP. And PrEP is not just for their community is for everybody but it's going to eliminate prep it is going to label pictures of two homo if if you and your friend y'all gay and y'all take a picture it will potentially label the photography as pornography and then that gives you the potential to be able to go to jail there is a threat on a lot of people's way of life There's also a threat on the bodily autonomy of women. And Black women have the highest mortality rate 
and the highest mortality rate of black women is in the state of Mississippi. This is not the time to be dividing the community. And I didn't remember to say it then, but I'm going to say it now. When it comes to Kamala Harris, black women are the greatest perpetuators of hate. But we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about this self-hate a little later. Let's let's jump into the next thing. So, hopefully I've been able to paint a very vivid picture of the potential of violence and the threat that we as African-American people in the um, United States are under. Let's talk about strategies for community protection and for communal solidarity. I always say that I try to be the person in which if I bring up a problem, I would like to be a solution giver. I will always be the person to try to provide a solution. So I have a lot of ideas. Um, First, I want to talk about after the election, and with the fact that we are going through inflation, astronomical inflation, I think that especially if you are able to and you are in warm climates, that you need to start growing your own foods. If you did not listen to the first episode I put out in season three, um, a message from Farmer John, we talked about the massive amount of recalls that are going on in the food in the food industry in the local grocery stores and supermarkets a lot of um cheese um meat produce things have been recalled at an astronomical rate and because of inflation food is extremely high so i would like to urge you all to start doing and supporting community gardens there are especially if you are in rural communities or in the projects. There are a lot of different organizations that I am aware of, especially in the state of Mississippi, but I know that if there is an AmeriCorps VISTA in your state, somebody is helping with communal gardens. There's at least one. You need to start working on hood gardening and doing community gardens. Now, when I say hood gardening, that is the promotion of self-sufficiency and community building with gardens. You need to be finding you some plastic buckets. You need to be finding you some plastic tubs, put some soil into it, getting you a little fertilizer, and getting you some seeds during the winter you need to be trying to save you some seeds if you eat some watermelon some tomatoes if you eat cucumbers if you get some mint if you got weed shit i need you to start putting them in jars figuring out a female seed from a male seed and learning what you can easily grow in your household because there will be a time Listen to me when I say this, because you need to get your house in order. There will be a time where you are not going to be able to access the supermarket. It might be one reason. It might be for a myriad of reasons, but you need to be doing your research and you need to be stocking and preparing. Let's go ahead and start working on it. Locate a community garden. Figure out what you can do to help go ahead and start preparing for the next spring because it is harvest season right now so that you can start being able to self-sufficiently grow your own produce and to be able to share the produce amongst communities if it is necessary. Next, you need to be able to understand who will and can protect you. Now, if you have been listening to... um. A lot of these episodes that we have been talking about, the episode I just put out with Jason, um, the double V campaign that talked about ex-veterans in the black community. If you um, have listened to me interview the farmers, you will know that there are a myriad of people that you should be able to theoretically go up to to start organizing within your communities and to know who to turn to in case there is a need of protection. 
yeah and to make sure you start working on the promise of protection especially for you prissy bitches that don't own guns and don't know how to shoot okay so i would say that you need to I think that there needs to be an association generated for former veterans. If you know any former veterans, I think that it would be wise to figure out how you can leverage those skills and experience from veterans as a way to be able to form a defense in the community. We can talk about um, the uh, Memphis massacre that happened. Again, if you want to hear more about it, listen to the Double V campaign. Um, during the Memphis manicure, ma- massacre, the African-American men who were returning World War One veterans were responsible for protecting the Black women, children, and men in those communities from the potential threat of... Um, white supremacy and violence um there was a mob and they were the first ones on the scene next i think that you need to figure out if it is necessary um and how to locate the nearest black panther party or new black panther party within your area their role is quite literally to help protect protect and aid the community during times of violence trust me they live for and this is exactly what they want to do contrary to popular um, belief yes the the government eradicated the Black Panther Party and they separated, but there is, and I'm very aware of the fact that there is many, especially in the South, and I would assume in the West where the party, the new Black, the Black Panther Party originated, there are branches of the new Black Panther Party. Um, and we saw them be on patrol, especially during the death of George Floyd, where there was always a threat of um, violence against white supremacists. They will patrol your neighborhoods. They will, like during the election, they were on watch. Just know during this next election, they will be on watch. You need to have an understanding of where your nearest one is located and how to get in contact because if something happens, if you need a protest organized, those would be the groups of people that I would reach out to. And that's just me. Next, I would suggest that you start organizing neighborhood watches in the same manner that the black the new black panther party does patrols i think that it would be wise for those in smaller communities to establish a local watch group protect the elders and protect the youth and protect the women next I really do want to emphasize the importance of staying informed and staying prepared In case you have not noticed, based on the amount of information I just spouted off to you about current history, recent history, we have been on political news watch. I want to shout out to my homegirl, Amelia Matthews. If you want to hear me and Amelia have a conversation, we have a conversation um, episode called Who Will Survive in America? And you will see that me and my bitch we watch the news we don't just be on nbc we watch all the news cnn nsp google youtube bitch of amazon say something crazy we gonna know okay i need you guys to stop receiving all of your information from social media and from the shade room and from Ball Alert. And I also don't want you to get caught up and watching only one news channel, especially for older Black people. I think that it is always wise to have an understanding of great independent journalists that you can keep up with. I love a good Joy Reid. Um, she is not African-American. She is from African descent, but she has a passion for the black community and she has a passion for justice and what is right is right. And she keeps her eyes to the to 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 the heels and her ill to the street and her her foot on white supremacist necks. But that's just me. Um, I want you guys to start storing water. I will always tell you all to that I am a believer that owning a gun is a form of 
self-love as a black person even if you don't know how to shoot you make sure you know how to pistol whip load up on bullets if you and i'm not encouraging violence i am encouraging preparation and self-defense and self-love just want to make that clear i will also encourage you all to buy maps you will also need cash on hand do not depend on your credit card and that pen okay if you did not know there was just a mass breach in our information where hackers stole all of our social security numbers they stole over 2.5 billion social security numbers person last names and birthdays in america the uk and in britain they got all our shit god damn it what would make you think that they won't hack in there and take our money too then the information that got leaked. You need some cash on you. You need some some guala. You need that bread. You need that turkey, that cheddar on you. That mom's bread. You need that thing on you and you need that money on you. You need a map. You need a map. In the threat of a, a power outage, you need to get you a local map of the state you are in. And if there are states that you frequent... I would get those too. And if you can get a regional map, get that too, baby. Okay, so what, what, let's go over the list after you get done listening to me because I got my map in my Amazon cart and I want you to listen to me, okay? You need to start storing seeds for the winter time and you need to be doing research on how to grow for the spring. That's just a good thing to know in general. You need to figure out who are the veterans who are the people that you can trust? Where do you need to go in case of emergency? Where do you all need to meet up? You need to help organize a neighborhood watch. You need to make sure that you are staying informed and prepared. What do you need? You need cash on hand. You need water. You need a map. And you need a prayer system. Make sure that your prayers is going up to God and they ain't just hitting the ceiling and bouncing back, okay? I want you guys to understand the nature and the scope of post-election violence. And I want to emphasize that communities can prepare and protect themselves against potential threats, as well as ensuring greater resilience and solidarity in times of political uncertainty. Let's talk about self-hate amongst Black people. Personally, I feel with the looming potential of a Kamala Harris presidency, presidency, the coon, the inner white man is just twitching and convulsing and trying to keep from hopping out of a lot of you. At first, I just thought it was going to be these niggas. These young men figured that they was going to show they behind because a lot of young men like to try to be different, you know? And sometimes they do it in some of the worst ways. I expected the massage noir to come out of a lot of Black people, right? And Black men specifically. And they didn't let me down. And what Brit? I mean, I knew it. Lord and mercy, I knew it was a potential of it happening. But when I seen it, boy, these black women out here been let, making us look bad. Now it is social media. Now it is it's you plus social media. It is the rise and black women and men being influenced by white Christian nationalist propaganda and right wing rhetoric that has influenced a lot of people within the black community. And we've been seeing it, Lord, Lord have mercy. We've been seeing it. We've been seeing it with Amber Rose. We've been seeing it with Candace Owen. Candace Owens ain't stopped her shit yet. Candace Owens is on fire for white supremacy. She ain't stopped. She ain't slowed down yet. Since them folks fired her, she done picked up steam, boy. Lord have mercy. And honestly, 
because the black community is a conservative community, sometimes I be understanding what she be saying. I do. And I'm ashamed to say that because she don't be wrong all the time. But this show don't mean the bitch be right all the time. During the Republican National Party, there were a lot of um, black people in attendance. And we're going to talk about it. Let me get back on track. Now, I feel like because of the looming threat of a presidential, the, the idea of a black woman being president and a white man being behind her, oftentimes black people have become insatiable. They can't find nothing right at all. And there's a lot of misinformation out there about Kamala Harris. And Kamala Harris also has yet to have addressed the Black community. I heard that there is a potential of a Dr. Umar interview with um, Kamala Harris. Liz, I would I love to see that, Jesus. But if there's not, Dr. Umar has been making a lot of great points because he also is not in support of Kamala Harris. He has not endorsed her. And regardless if you think so or not, Dr. Umar's opinion impacts a lot of the things that we do within our community. Um, but with a lot of people... They are insatiable. Nothing will satisfy them. And they can literally find a problem within anyone. And it's like people don't realize that no one, no one is perfect. This is not the 1970s. This is not JFK Jr., the golden boy running again. With social media, with background searches, with people being real humans and making real mistakes, you are bound to find something. Again, I wanted to reiterate the fact that the black community is mostly conservative in thought as well as in religion. And they are on social media, especially these younger people are on social media and they are repeating Christian Natalie's rhetoric um, for financial gain and for clout. So you have people who want to be, do not care. They don't care about um, morality they just want the money and they will get on social media and they will say whatever they need to say in order to rage bait, in order to cause controversy, in order to make money on these social media apps. And a lot of you black people fall for it every time. Y'all need to be an observer. Everything does not deserve a response to it. I see it and I keep it moving. And then I actually go and do something about it in real life. That needs to, and that's something I would encourage a lot of African Americans to start doing. Because people are purposely being put, whether someone put them there on purpose or they're positioning themselves, they are repeating this rhetoric. They are irritating and upset, upsetting a lot of people in order to get money or to obtain clout. A lot of black people are also being influenced by propaganda. A lot of black celebrities are being paid or they're being given incentives in order to make an appearance and publicly support Donald Trump. We seen this late last year with Six Red. She was doing podcasts telling people that she supported Donald Trump. That if Donald Trump gets into office, she won't stem it. Everybody in the hood love Donald Trump. And that is not true. That's just not what the algorithm is supporting. We've been seeing YG. YG been in the hood telling people about how he's read Project 2025 and how it will give the police um, the authority and the freedom to be able to harm African-American people because that is what harm people and to be able to get away with it. They they won't be held responsible for it. And we know that African-American people are systemically impacted by police brutality and police death. Okay? But you have motherfuckers like Waka Flocka in the club telling people that if you are not a Kamala, if you are a Kamala Harris voter, you need to get the fuck out the club. So you are isolating individuals who are choosing to vote a certain way and you are kicking them out and you making them feeling bad and you shaming them. Then you have celebrities, celebrities like Lil Wayne and uh, Kodak Black who were seen with him during his last campaign trail who supported him in order to obtain something, maybe to obtain freedom out of jail. I tell you this, 
if Donald Trump was able to get Young Thug out of jail, he'd have every nigga, every nigga in East Atlanta would be up there voting for him. Cause he'll do it. They they getting out of jail. They 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 ain't getting the immunity. Donald Trump getting them right. And because the celebrity is the idol of the black community, y'all, y'all, y'all become starry-eyed, and that's all you want to do. Same thing can be said about Kamala Harris and when she was in Atlanta. She didn't propose any bills to help protect black women or black people or to push the idea of um, reparations or a anti-hate bill against black people. No, she just invited Megan Thee Stallion on stage to show her ass in some office pants. So there is propaganda going on on both sides. But I feel like when we're talking about self-hate amongst black people, there needs to be a discussion on systemic racism, media portrayals, and internalized oppression. Let's talk about Michaela Montgomery. Now, for those who don't know, Michaela Montgomery was originally, quote unquote, found at a Chick-fil-A. She bumped into Donald Trump. And um, she lost her mind, gave him a kiss. Now, if you don't, if you have not noticed it, Michaela Montgomery is the token black in this situation. She is the replacement for the other two black women who were on the campaign trail with Donald Trump um, prior to this election. They were two plus size black women and one of them passed away, unfortunately, because of health issues. But because one of them passed away, he done revamped it, got him a new little token. And I mind you, I never want you to forget for you Trump supporting Negroes, the tokens always get spent. The Michaela Montgomery young lady ended up speaking at the uh, Republican National Party, the, the conference, the Republican National Conference, you know. Baby, they slapped a synthetic wig on top of her head and cocked that motherfucker to the side and they let her bring her own speech. And it sounded, if you listen to the rhetoric in which Michaela is speaking, it sounds good. I can't even lie. When I listened to her, I said, this girl is a problem because everything she said was not wrong. I think that when people do stuff like that, they omit the fact of the things that will harm the black community. If um, a Donald Trump would be elected, if there is the possibility of us going through a life we under Project 25, where 2025, where women's reproductive, reproductive rights are taken away, when there's no more birth control, there's no more access to abortions in any state, not just in some states, when there is, because that's, that's what they're pushing. And the disillusionment of PrEP, or the police having more access, more civil liberties than what they already need. The the ability to oppress education because that is what they're attacking with this. And so it sounded good, but one must keep in mind of the things that could be lost. And that's why I feel like Michaela Montgomery is a problem. She is. She didn't sound like a white Republican for Trump. She sounded like any one of these so-and-so activists that are Democrats, Black Democrats. She had a beautiful rhetoric. She did not cold switch. She sounded like Southern niggas. She sounded like me up there. And it was astonishing. Because she got up there and she tap danced for them white people. Just for them to turn around and say, we don't like her. She's unprofessional. She don't make us feel comfortable. And that's what y'all tend to forget. That's what I mean when I say tokens get spent. Same thing with Amber Rose. Them Republicans, them they don't want Amber Rose up there. They told that gal to get. They don't like her. They don't. 
So on top of the Michaela Montgomery girl, there is the Blacks for Trump phenomenon and its implications. But someone asked a great question. They um, were talking about whether or not they really exist outside of social media. And of course, there were, like I said, there were a few Black people there. But I have seen and heard many rumors of the potential of non-Black people using tactics to make their skin look darker and purposely standing behind Donald Trump in the rallies. Um, And we've also seen the AI-generated pictures of Black women supporting Donald Trump. And again... We have seen this uptick of Black people being pro-Trump for money on social media or the possibility of those people being bought. So is there really Blacks for Trump? Also, when I was thinking about self-hate in the Black community and I was talking about Black men, it reminded me of the Black men that owned the barbershop in Atlanta who had the Trump campaign call them and say that Donald Trump would like to use your facility out of all the barbershops in Atlanta to sit up here and talk about small businesses and what black small businesses would be like under a Trump presidency. And when he got up there, he got railroaded because all them niggas was in barber chairs and they were being prompted to speak highly about Donald Trump in front of TV cameras instead of talking about the initial topic, which was what the barber was initially being told that they wanted to talk about um, black businesses under a Trump presidency. They were railroaded. They felt uncomfortable. They had other black leaders in those positions talking about how great Donald Trump was and made a mockery of those men and I'm sure they did it for the opportunity for publicity and to be different and they received backlash for it self-hate self-hate is what's gonna get you why why would you stray away from the group now when you need your brother Uh, It's just shocking to me how so many people so quickly forget that regardless of if you see yourself as a black person or not, they still see you as a black person. Regardless if you think differently, when the police pull you over, you are still a nigga. Whether you think that way or not, it has nothing to do with you. It is about them. Again, there are a lot of things that everything is not what it seems. Be mindful when you are seeing the amount of self-hate going on within these um, places and institutions, social media, in rallies, on TV, because everything seems to be a trick of the eye when it comes to the presidency campaign of Donald J. Trump. You all came out to see me, so... <laughs> My name is Michaela Montgomery. A lot of you guys know me as the girl from Chick-fil-A, but I am so much more than that. (laughs) Not only do I serve as the CEO of Conserve the Culture, I am also the state director for Blexit down here in Georgia. I'm a Fulton County coordinator for America First Works, and I'm also launching a podcast on the Patriots Prayer Network, so put some respect on my name. into it. See, as a young single mother, I can tell y'all that rent is too damn high. I I can tell you that as a young black voter, groceries are too damn high. And as an American citizen, period, seniors like my parents should never have to choose between medicine or food. It should never be the quality of life versus the quantity of life. And I don't want to hear, oh, 
oh, but we capped the price of insulin and lowered the price of all these medicines. Yeah, but you raised the price of everything else, so it's about time to start telling the truth to Americans and let them know exactly what they're signing up for if they want to vote for Kamala Harris. We need to vote based on facts and not feelings. See, under Harris and Biden, the average Georgia household is losing $1,060 per month, and inflation is at 21.4%. And due to the war on energy, average gas prices have reached record highs for the state. We also did a poll, and 80% of us black Americans are not happy with the current state of the economy. So I'm going to need 80% of y'all to vote accordingly in November. They love me. They love me. They really love me. The left wants you to get in your feelings about things that have been said, but I want you guys to pay attention to what has been done. They don't want to talk policy. They just want to use propaganda to steal your vote. The left is trying to tout this woman as a savior for the black community, but all she's done is hurt the black community since she came into the game. See, the first step in destroying the black community is to dismantle the black family. So aside from her record as a prosecutor, why don't we ask Mrs. Willie Brown if Kamala Harris cares about black families? I wonder if Mrs. Willie Brown, a black woman, is also with her. A few days ago, President Trump said he didn't know Vice President Harris was a black woman. I'm trying to figure out what all the outrage is about because she's only black when it's time to get elected. <laughs> Did I lie? The same black people who are mad at Trump for being confused about her race, ethnicity, nationality, whatever, are seemingly forgetting that while you're touting her as a savior for black people, she identifies as an Asian woman. She chose her side and it wasn't ours. When asked if she would ever do anything specifically for black people, she said no. Whereas Trump gave us the platinum plan, <laughs> which specifically uplifted the black community by increasing capital by almost $500 billion, creating 500,000 new black businesses, and would give black churches the ability to fight for federal resources for their communities. And why are we acting like strong borders aren't a thing literally everywhere else in the world? Since when has being patriotic been a crime? See, a few weeks ago at the debate, Trump mentioned black jobs. And a lot of people got in an uproar as if they didn't know what he meant. Well, we go to the polls and cast our black vote. We go to the stores and spend our black dollar. We live in our black community, but for whatever reason, we draw the line at a black job. But wait, because if you're wondering what a black job is, please, I encourage you all to drive through Atlanta at all these beautiful black-owned businesses and check and see who works there. Probably a black person working for a black entrepreneur, recycling the black dollar, creating black generational wealth. If they come here illegally and they're taking your jobs and your resources, then please believe my cousins in the Appalachians, they coming for you too. And y'all know Kamala Harris has yet to say Lake and Riley's name. As borders are, she opened the border to millions of illegal immigrants that have flooded American streets with deadly drugs and gangs that have spiked overdoses by over 124% and brought more crime into commu uh, excuse me, minority communities. So how's that for black folks? But let's take race out of it. Just as a woman, period. How can you be a champion for women's rights when you're taking away opportunities from biological women and giving them to transgendered ones? done. See, how can you promote equity for women and you're allowing men to play in women's sports? And what kind of feminists would still allow men to enter their sacred spaces, i.e. our bathrooms and school locker rooms? Do I even need to mention the opening ceremony at the Olympics? Angela 
Karini was forced to fight a man and told us that she's never been punched so hard in her life. We cannot allow dangerous liberals who think things like this are okay into the White House, because my daughter will not be fighting a man at her wrestling match. And what I think both men and women can agree on is that national security is important. So who would y'all rather see lead us into war if it were so to happen? My silk press sister Kamala or the big dog Donald Trump? And lastly, I cannot get up here without mentioning my farmers, the backbone of this country. And aside from the Biden-Harris administration hurting you guys in ways we can't even comprehend by the rising cry, uh, cost of everything, black farmers cited with the Inflation Reduction Act signed in 2022. Now, don't let the Biden-Harris administration fool you because they waited until the ninth hour to, dis uh, to sign off on disbursements as a last-minute attempt to garnish support. But why would they hurt the agricultural industry? Probably because they're looking forward to making more money in the pharmaceutical one. And speaking of pharmaceuticals, because I promise I'm going to wrap this up. When they bring up abortion and they talk about protecting your medical freedoms, don't be afraid to mention COVID. The Biden-Harris administration forced Americans to take an experimental vaccine and took away their jobs, their livelihoods, and their freedoms if they refused. Trump gave us a choice and Biden gave us a mandate. I would like to talk about some of the more frequent sightings of white supremacy groups and racial violence, especially in the American South. Um, not only have I been on Coon Watch, I have been on Klan Watch as well. You know, some of my personal interests and habits that I do have. And there has also been an uptick in different uh, white supremacy groups from the Proud Boys to the Ku Klux Klan, um, as well as uh, the police. Let's talk about it. The first thing that I'd like to focus on is the Ku Klux Klan um, dropping leaflets um, in Tennessee. Now, according to the Nashville banner, on Wednesday, Larry Turnley was walking through North Nashville as he does regularly. Um, as he passed under I-40 along Arthur Avenue, something caught his eye, a piece of paper folded up inside of a plastic baggie. I always wanted to keep his neighborhood free from trash. Mr. Turnley picked it up and curious, he opened the bag and unfolded the paper and it was a leaflet advertising a Kentucky chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. Quote, I was like, wow, I wonder who put this here. And that is what Mr. Turnley told Banner. The upper right of the leaflet featured a cartoon drawing a grotesquely caricatured black man grabbing his crotch and holding onto a white woman with a bruised eye. Next to the drawing, the text reads, burn the coal pay the toll, a reference to a racist term for white women who date brown or, brown or black men. Below the leaflet reads segregation yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Then Turnley went back home. He decided to make a video about it for Instagram. Quote, stay vigilant, he said, adding that some visitors to Nashville don't have good motives. Turnley told Burner that his post prompted numerous responses. One neighbor messaged him to say that they knew about the leaflets but hadn't said anything because they, quote, did not want to give them the publicity. Based on his walk schedule, Turnley believes the leaflets were dropped over time that weekend. Others in the community sent him images of two other flyers through his Instagram account, including one with the message, quote, white women with mixed kids are like pigs with warts. 
Turnley said one person reached out to him to say that a couple in the neighborhood with mixed race children had one of their car, one of their tires slash. It was unclear whether this was directly connected to the leaflets, and the banner was unable to independently confirm the incident. But at the very least, some residents saw a connection. As for Turnley, beyond the shock of seeing materials like this dropped in North Nashville, he saw another connection as well. All of the rhetoric and all of the things taking place here at the state legislature, I think, has emboldened people, making them feel comfortable to do something like this. This was, um, let me see if I can find a date for this, because this was something that happened quite recently. This was May 14th, 2024. Now, um, recently, there was an incident of the Proud Boys marching in Tennessee as well. Let me see if I can pull up a document for you guys really quick. Lee, yes, this is from reg.com and it is published July 8, 2024. Nashville, Tennessee from WKRN News. State and local leaders are reacting after a group of called quote Patriot Front was seen marching through downtown Nashville Saturday afternoon. More than a hundred people believed to be a part of Patriot Front marched through the streets of downtown Nashville July 6th, covering their faces with masks while holding shields and Confederate flags. According to the Anti-Defamation League, Patriot Front is a, quote, white supremacist group whose members maintain that their ancestors conquered America, bequeathing to them and no one else. In the statement, Tennessee Democratic Party Chair Hardell Ramaz said, quote, this is what we're fighting against in Tennessee. This is what we're fighting against in America. While our Republican state leaders sit quietly by, we refuse to let hate field racists terrorize our community. That was also in Nashville. Of course, you also know about the death of Sonia Massey and police violence towards Black people in America. I will tell you, I personally refuse to watch Sonia Massey's video. I refuse to watch it because I want to prioritize my mental health. Because my soul grieves for anyone who unjustly is killed. But watching it on social media is not something that I know that I can personally handle. But, and although I did not see her death, I can definitely, and I'm definitely aware of the backlash in which she received, um, the way that People came to justify her death. The caricatures, memes that were created by um, right-wing white supremacists who were making fun of Sonia Massey's mental health. Caricatures of her speaking in AAVE, um, jokes about boiling pots of water. Even so, we can talk about uh, Donald Trump talking about Sonia Massey at the NABG, this the National um, Black Journalist Conversation, where he openly kind of justified her death. Um, he kind of made light of the situation. Um, you can also think about how the police officer who murdered Sonia Massey um, is a part of, is marrying into a very wealthy and affluent family where he lives and they are making sure that he is going to receive the best care and he has advocacy and groups of people surrounding him, supporting him um, to make sure that he does not go down for the very cruel and cold murder of Sonia Massey. Now, when we are talking about the frequent sighting of white supremacy groups and racial violence, it would be very ignorant of me not to 
talk about the current situation going on in Great Britain. Ironically enough, um, Black, not even Black, excuse me, because they're not Black and they don't want to be represented as Black. The Africans that migrated from Africa to Great Britain who are not even recognized or given any type of respect in Great Britain, who've been on social media, down talking Black Americans and Americans and and all that stuff, they being harassed in UK. Let's let's talk about it. Let me see if I can pull up an article about what is going on in the UK. UK race riots. Who? What caused the UK race riots in 2024? They followed a mass stabbing in Southport on the 29th of July, in which three children were killed. The attacker was falsely alleged on social media to be a Muslim asylum seeker. The riot first started in Southport, and later many protests and riots have spread across the country. Not only are they putting um, Muslims, those who are Middle Eastern, at in um, places of trouble, but Africans. Those who are uh, migrants that come from African descent are also um, in fear for their lives. They have been attacked. Anyone who is not white got to fight, you know, because if it ain't white, it ain't right. They attacking if it ain't white on site. You understand me? And they stab down there. We do shootouts. They stab pokey poke. It's just ironic to me because um, I've also done a conversation with Femi Johnson about why it seems that those of African descent um, that are that did not migrate to the America seem to have um, a grudge against African Americans and you know they feel like we have it easy over here and maybe we have it easy over here because there is some support and solidarity there is unions here grassroots we are the home of protesting we started that that was our thing but there does not seem to be any help and support over there and with how nasty they've been talking about black communities my brothers and sisters are not bringing any awareness to it so you know I just thought I'd bring it up. I just see the parallels between the experiences of Black communities in the UK and the United States. The only difference would be that my community is more bound to react and they will react violently. Um, and that reminds me of Lord have mercy. What's that? Still I rise, my Angelou. She was talking about if someone's in trouble, one of the greatest people to reach out to would be a thug because of virtually someone who is considered a thug has nothing to lose and they're more likely to come out and help. So you reach out to Gangsta Boo if you in trouble, baby. You make that call one call that's all, baby. Tell him to bring his blick. Tell him to put that dick on his hip and come through, baby, okay? But I really do want to highlight the importance of global Black solidarity. I don't want the Africans to crash out like the Palestinians and the Middle Easterns are crashing out on my people because that's not fair. It's not fair at all. And we need to be sharing resources and support for anti-racism efforts in Britain. You know, but that's if they want to um, receive our help. I'm the last guy who wants to fear monger. Very last one. Got a couple predictions for 2024. Stick with me here. There will be some kind of blackout or something that happens that disrupts the power grid for multiple days. The type of frenzy that's going to bring will be absolutely insane. But... I've had this theory for about a year. A blackout needs to occur to instate a widespread digital currency and to bypass an election. I don't know if this is a bipartisan thing or this is a one side is going to force it to happen. The other side doesn't want it to happen. But the, the, these are the... I, I, I had the Kamala thing happening like six, seven months ago. So I'll just start telling you what I'm thinking is going to happen in the next six. We've basically created a climate for Donald Trump to not be able to lose this election. 
Like, no matter what anybody says, especially no matter what any Democrat says, we've created an environment to where if he wins the election, then the MAGA patriots are going to say, God made that happen. But if he loses, they're going to say, the devil is inflicting with our election. And then they're going to attempt to, I don't know, like an in international coup or something. I, I don't know if they've, how far they've expanded from January 6th. I understand that takes a couple extra brain cells uh, to put together a better plan. I'm not sure how much funding they put aside to spend on intellectuals, but you have to realize this. As American politics have been bought out, they are the talking heads of the wealthy now. They are not the speaking heads of the people. It is not we the people. It is we the powerful, and you, the people, will do what we, the powerful, say. So knowing that, everybody who exists in Congress and in like the kind of main stage of government, they are all either wealthy or connected to somebody who's wealthy. So even in a world where it is rich versus poor, they will be protected. So it does make sense for the Democrats to sabotage this election because then they don't actually have to act like they give a fuck about the marginalized people that they claim to be representing when a civil war happens and real Americans start dying by the hands of other Americans and somebody actually has to do something about it because there was never a plan to stop that from happening. But we all know that we're creating a space for it to happen. And the wild part about... Uh, this theory is just going to get crazy. The wild part about a civil war happening is that instead of just jailing all these protesters and denying them rights and all of this stuff, you can just get rabid Americans who think they're actual patriots living in the Second Revolutionary War to delete other Americans under the pretense that some blonde Jesus that was born in Africa is telling them to do it because this is their promised land and this is the only thing that actually makes them feel purposeful in this life. Think about this. The same way poor Americans get wrapped up into like the hyper-racist, hyper-military bullshit like propaganda mindset is the same way the rich white people who have nothing to do with their lives get wrapped up into like psychedelics and DMT attempting to just blow their brains out from the inside. Just purposelessness but access to so much privilege and opportunity and just lack of ability to understand how to utilize that in a way that makes this world a better place so they just turn it on destroying themselves on the inside or destroying the world around them and continuing to not address the real problems that they're responsible for so simply well actually i don't think i even finished that point when you allow random americans to delete other Americans. You don't have to use the U.S. military and taxpayer dollars to do it. And you can just arrest these bad Americans, but like, you know, thank them silently for doing your job. And then after they've destroyed all the places in America that you don't like, which probably are going to be Democratic-run cities, um, and they wreak havoc there and create their own cop cities and whatnot, then you're going to reinvest in these basically privately owned and run militias of everyday people to make sure that they are the walking on foot surveillance state, making sure that you can build your Christian nationalist Mount Olympus from the top without ever having to worry about any marginalized fucks destroying your vision like MLK or Malcolm X ever, ever again. So what's the point of having a blackout again if all of this shit has the potential to happen? So this is what. The blackout just displaces and puts people in such a place of fear and panic. If the people don't start civil warring and purging themselves off that point right there, you can take the power out of the people's hands. And just when you turn the power back on to society... You can just turn it back on to the way that is already adjusted to a means where the ruling class has gotten their way. And so where everything has just been turned back on, it's not been turned back on. The world has been turned back on into a new reality. And now we are all slaves to that reality. And I'll talk about this more in upcoming videos, but 
we are being transitioned into a world where everyday people are going to be forced to depend for 24 7 on this virtual fake reality to compensate for having our real reality reality stolen from us so we could attempt to experience it by living vicariously through rich people who literally don't even have good intentions or good like means with the wealth that they extract from our communities and ourselves every day the like you guys you guys i don't know if you guys see it i don't know i think you guys might be watching a little too much love island <laughs> they're I don't know if I want to call them big banks or like big finance in America has been fucking up so much money. They're praying that big tech can produce another like social media era and just stimulate the whole entire economy with this AI shit to save them from all the poor business decisions that they made. And then the world can go back to how the world was, where, like, you know, the top 25% were the only people experiencing anything, and everybody else just watched it from TV. But what they don't understand is that AI isn't coming to save anybody. AI is simply an opportunity. And we haven't created any genuine value to appreciate our society, so AI won't be an opportunity to actualize or to maximize on that it's only gonna be an opportunity to maximize on the means of production the means of society by which we've upheld to this point and it's all been oppressive it's all been dehumanizing it's all been selfish narcissistic bro for a class of people that we'll never get to see in our working lives bro in our waking lives but hey <laughs> i'm the crazy one I want to thank you guys so much to, uh, for listening to Freestyle 3, Get Your House in Order. I'm not in the mood to play no games. I'm not in the mood to shout nobody out. I'm not in the mood to pray for nobody. I just want the promise of protection. And that is a concept that was coined in the 1970s by black female activists that talk about how black women were often promised protection and yet in um, recent years it almost feels like that promise has been denied and I, again as I was talking about at the beginning of this episode I feel like I feel like if it is anybody's responsibility to protect the black woman the black family it is our responsibility. It is almost ignorant to expect any other group to protect us. So this is my way of showing love to warn you all, to get your houses in order, to remind you all of the importance of community organizing and resource sharing. We prompt you guys to shift, shift from individualism and come into the community. Um, I want to remind you guys again to develop a contingency plan regardless of the election outcome. Make sure that you have a meeting place to go to that is outside of big cities. Make sure you are buying water, water purifiers, get you a map, state map, regional map. If you got the money, get you a power generator, get a gun, a bullet if you are feeling Go buy you one of them police boutons that they beat Rodney King ass with. You got to be like Charleston White and go get that goddamn pig poke, okay? And have you some cash money on hand. I just want to encourage you guys to be proactive with engagement and to be vigilant within your communities. If you need me, reach out to me at the Afrocentric Podcast at gmail.com. Now, I want to thank you guys so much for choosing to be Afrocentric today. Please remember wherever you are that Black lives do indeed matter. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Please make sure to listen and to protect Black women and children. And the only thing that you must do in this lifetime is to be Black and die. 
And remember that here at the Afrocentric Podcast, we are just civilized people having civilized conversations. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye. And I'm going to tell you this right now. Every black person listening to me, on November the 5th, you need to be in a black community when the election results are read. My bougie nigga living in the suburbs, living in an all-white community, you do not want to be caught outside on November the 5th if Donald Trump loses. We only got three months and a few weeks to the presidential election on November 5th. You mean to tell me Joe Biden backs out with three months left, anoints Kamala to his spot. She only got three months to campaign and you still going to be a very popular Donald Trump? Do you think the American people are going to believe Donald Trump lost fairly? And if poor white America thinks they were robbed of this election, that January 6th uh, takeover, that was nothing but a, a, a pool party for what you're about to see in this country if Donald Trump lose this election. I would not want to be a black person in a white neighborhood on November the 5th, 2024, when those presidential election results are read and Donald Trump is not the winner. I believe white folks are going to show up and show out art. You better have a gun, a knife. Black people better exercise, what is it, our Second Amendment rights? White America going to flip off, Art. I'm going to make sure I'm ready, brother. Make sure you're ready. And I want all my American Africans out there, wherever you live in America, especially if you're in a city that's predominantly white, if you're in a state that's predominantly white, black people, please be prepared for what can happen on these streets if Donald J. Trump loses that election. <laughs>